Hey guys, so it's a high season for us. So one of the main things we're trying to prevent across the organization is burnouts. So here are 10 lessons on how to evaluate, how to predict, how to anticipate, how to prevent a burnout as a whole. Number one, burnouts are often not directly related to work. Now, according to the Physical Wellness Services Organization, there are different reasons for a burnout. Work-related is, of course, one of the reasons, but ever so often, one of the main reasons is external factors and other life problems with family, with friends, with other, uh, you know, your significant other, whoever it is, could really influence you and affect you on a personal level, on a business level, on any other level leading to a potential burnout. So it's really important to analyze the core reason and essentially see what happens. Uh, number two, it's really easy to reach the burnout if there's a major mismatch between your core skills and the job description. That happens especially for new hires and new jobs or if you're trying to pursue a new type of specialty, such as trying to step in the first time as a senior engineering role, VP role, senior management, something else that's really uh, kind of beyond your core expectations here in a very high demanding company. So uh, if you're not ready to really push extremely hard in order to catch up, make sure that there is a decent alignment between your core skills, expectations, and the expectations of the company as well. Number three, work-related burnouts can be detected earlier. Meaning that usually if it's purely work-related, it's a consecutive process of regular overtimes, lots of stress, lots of kind of anger, pain points, and, and, and other things that you can establish. So if you're aware of burnouts, if you're afraid of burnouts as well, uh, well, always keep an eye on this. Always check in with your colleagues, with your friends, see if you're getting more anxious, more annoyed, more aggressive one way or another. Uh, see if you're having a pretty hard time taking out sleep, things like that that may be affecting you, maybe a predecessor of a burnout or something that you can actually resolve as early as possible. So always make sure that you actually revise this upfront. Number four is the stress management curve is pretty elastic. Now, it's a pretty interesting curve that goes from a very lazy position to getting some work done then getting some traction and then a little bit more stress and then some anxiety and then, you know, some more pressure at work, but it's really a long journey. So it's important to kind of analyze the different steps of the journey and see where you're at, where you're most comfortable at, because no stress doesn't necessarily mean that this is the best uh, way possible or this is the, the best way to kind of move forward. While some people really thrive under pressure, some people are really passionate about solving problems uh, with, you know, some pushing behind them. So figure out what's your best comfort zone and try to kind of influence external factors whenever needed to just keep you in the zone for a longer period of time. Now, number five, high responsibility burns more fuel. Now, of course, the higher the responsibility, the more you're going to be uh, subject to a potential burnout. And of course, if you're doing something that's extremely... Uh, simple, extremely repetitive, it's easier to not burn out uh, unless you're really bored to death and want to just escape this job forever. But if it's something demanding, if it's something risky, if it's something where there's a lot at stake, if you're kind of solely responsible, one of the main people responsible for that, again, being a team lead, senior major, or, or someone else who's in charge, then if you're not really that experienced, if you're anxious, if you're unsure of what you've done, all of that may actually cause you to burn out sooner rather than later. So always try to manage expectations, try to manage the reality, try to get a kind of a reality check of what's happening and where you're at, and this is going to help you uh, keep your energy levels at a normal place, more or less. Number six, finding the core reason is paramount. Again, as discussed a bit earlier, uh, not all burnouts are related to work. Some burnouts are indeed related to personal matters, and sometimes it's worth even taking, you know, a couple of days off of work to resolve your personal issues or just discuss that with your family members or try to isolate yourself or something else in order to identify and resolve the core reason. Because without resolving the core reason, even if you take, you know, a week off of work and just, you know, go on a holiday, do something else, if the core reason is still there pestering you, that's not really going to help you go through 
the burnout process and, and get restored earlier as possible. Because restoring from a burnout may be a, a venture that takes many months to really overcome and get back to your initial energy state. Number seven, people refresh in different ways. Now, if some of your colleagues really chill with Netflix or with fitness or something else, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is your thing. So in general, and that's not only for burnouts, but in general, just to keep your energy levels intact, it's important to understand how you chill most efficiently because some people uh, may prefer to do some workouts because you know they keep their energy juice at the right level or something else. So it works for some. Others prefer to play video games. Uh, again, watch Netflix, binge it, go, go to cinema, uh, I don't know, do some other stuff. It really depends on each uh, one's personality. So uh, if you're just starting a new job or so, it may be worth uh, to do some experiments and see how you feel refreshed at the end of the weekend, for example, before the new week starts and what really helps you get in the right mood. Sometimes it may be seasonal. Uh, for example, you know, over summer you may refresh at the uh, at the beach. Over the winter you may refresh with a movie or a glass of wine. People have different preferences, but just figure it out for yourself because it's really important to know how to regain your energy levels if you're really tired after a long work week. Number eight, variety helps a lot, and that variety is important both for the different ways of refreshing that we mentioned. Also, variety at work, some, like I said, some people really have a hard time just doing repetitive activities over and over. And for some, it's important to just switch between different duties, between different projects, different activities, different types of work, or kind of stepping in as a uh, deputy team leader at times, or helping manager, just changing the type of environment at work in order to keep uh, your mind intact without uh, really being... Uh, you know, staying to the same old routine, which really gets within your comfort zone, which often results in no development, being lazy, being stagnant, and, and generally not really improving a lot. So trying to find different ways to spark variety at work is another thing that may actually help you uh, get better with your energy levels. Number nine, never ignore your health and sleep. If you're sick and trying to push harder, this may be problematic and cause you to burn out sooner. If you don't get enough sleep over continuous periods of time, this is often a recipe for disaster, also known as burnout. Now, this has other different points to, to kind of consider. Amount of workout you have on a weekly basis, again, uh, family matters and problems and whatnot. Your food habits, that's actually super important because if you're eating tons of junk food, uh, you may really feel dizzy most of the time and not really be able to catch up and you're going to go through all those hoops of high energy and then, uh, you know, some stagnant mood. So just keeping those intact is really important because those are kind of the essentials, the basic, the basics that you need to maintain in-house. And number 10, which is something that I added recently, is focusing on the right action items. Sometimes, especially if it's work-related, and to be honest, not only work-related, people try to uh, prioritize the wrong things. For example, if you're, let's say if you're an engineer, you may be spending uh, 15 hours a week on documentation. If it's not something that your company really needs or it's a high priority, then this may be a problem. Or sometimes it's the other way around. If you're a software engineer and you're not maintaining your documentation, there may be a problem. So figure out what are the activities that really get a decent return on investment of the company. Figure out with your manager and the senior management what are the top priorities uh, what's really important for the company as a whole, what are the things that are worth for you to spend your time on as compared to just doing 20 of things at a time with 80% uh, of them not really generating any results. Uh, again, don't forget the Pareto principle. 80% uh, of the work could be done in 20% of the time. So sometimes 80% of your time may be focused on the wrong 20% of the work. So if you manage that ratio and if you follow the other nine steps, for the most part, you should be good to go and you should be getting away from the burnout stage as compared to getting closer to it.